And let's just go ahead and uh, take a look. I think you got a copy of it. You've been getting a copy of it in your bulletin for some time, and that is this this whole catechism thing. Uh, I hope you've been at least you know paying attention to it, and uh, hopefully it's been enriching some of the some of your thoughts regarding how the Lord works and what is truly important to Him. And we've snuck in the Ten Commandments on you here uh, the last several weeks, and so I believe this is where we are. Question twelve. Uh, so let's just go ahead and. And I'll ask the question, and we'll read it together, and then we will, we will take a look at the, at the reading that goes along with it. What does God require in the ninth and tenth commandments? Ninth, that we do not lie or deceive, but speak the truth in love. Tenth, that we are content, not envying anyone or resenting what God has given us for them, or them for us. And the reading is simply this, James 2.8. If ye fulfill the royal law according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, ye do well. Father, this morning, <clears throat> we're grateful for all of your word, not just the ones that appeal to us and not just the ones that we think are most important, but we're grateful that you've given us a word in both testaments that are worth knowing today. Father, we also are aware that you've given us these laws and these commandments that many people think are strictly Old Testament. We know you've given it to us to help us understand we can't keep a law and that we can't be good enough. And that leads us, of course, to the cross of Christ. Father, may you bless the preaching of your word this morning and be magnified here among us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. So here we are a week away from Palm Sunday and Jerry Thorpe being with us and preaching on that particular day. And as Cheryl said, uh, I'll reiterate, I appreciate Cheryl doing all these announcements. She's really not fond of doing it, but she's been pressed into service by someone. But I do appreciate her doing that. And, uh, but she's right. The men's breakfast we're having next Saturday, that's going to be great. And we, don't, we haven't done it very often. Uh, so if you have some time on Saturday morning and you want to come and we've got some, some guys cooking, you won't believe, uh, who know their stuff. And so plan on it. And uh, we'll have some fellowship together. Jerry will be bringing a devotion. Uh, it's going to be a great deal of, I won't say fun, but it is a, a solemn weekend. But it will be fun. And, uh, you know, wherever there's food and wherever there's Thorpe, there's fun. Amen. Food plus Thorpe equals fun. But he'll be preaching next Sunday, and of course that Sunday will be Palm Sunday. He's already given me a, a little bit of a preview. He's going to take us to the cross on that Sunday. And so what we're talking about here uh, this Sunday, what we've been talking about, we started last week, uh, is, is sort of the journey to the cross. Um, it's, a, it's a series that takes a look at exactly how Jesus came to die. Uh, simply calling it killing Jesus. This Sunday, we're going to take a look at the silence. This last Sunday, we talked about betrayal. We talked about betrayal. We talked about Judas. We talked about a particular kind of betrayal. Uh, last Sunday night, we continued that because I didn't finish it Sunday morning. And this might be one of those two that I may have to finish tonight because I'm not sure I'll get through it all this morning. But there's several elements to this whole notion of killing Jesus. Again, this time of year, what you'll find is you've got all sorts of History Channel stuff and Discovery Channel stuff and stuff, and that's the best word I can find for it because it's just stuff, and it's mostly wrong. But what you find is that most people will tend to think, most uh, non-Christian or, or sort of objective historians want to paint Jesus out to be a martyr. And they want to say that this death was a tragedy. Um, they want to look at it as sort of a classic I don't know, kind of tragedy, Greek tragedy sort of situation where it could have been avoided. But we've been on the trail here seeing how deliberate this was. And we talked about the betrayer last Sunday, like I said. If I get through this this morning, we'll talk about the masterminds uh, this evening or the plot to kill Jesus, the actual plot. Uh, but this morning we're going to talk about the silence and exactly how it was used in order to bring Jesus to the cross. Because I don't think it's something anyone is ever very immune from and no, and, and no one is too far away from. And we will see at the end, and I'm thinking this might be actually on Easter, but we might see at the end, we will see at the end, something shocking, I think. The true mastermind of the one who killed Jesus. And that might be something that is worth inviting a friend to hear. Uh, the one who actually orchestrated the whole thing, the, the chief or the, 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 the indispensable element of the plot to kill Jesus, I suppose is the best way to say it. 
There's a saying here, though, this morning I want to refresh in your memory. You've heard it before, I'm sure, often. Uh, but uh, it is, it is uh, maybe four or five hundred years old, four hundred years old, something like that. And it's something that says something to, the, to this effect. You've heard it. The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. Have you heard that? Have you ever heard that before? The only thing necessary for evil to triumph is for good men to do nothing. So keep that in your mind as we walk through this this morning and see this, this next component to the plot to kill Jesus, and that is simply uh, talking about silence. But it, this, this quote is, is, is often quoted whenever ugly or, or costly action is considered in the interest of stopping evil. And it reminds us of a couple of things. It reminds us, and it's compelling in our world for a couple of reasons. One is that evil truly exists and it seeks to expand. Always. You'll never get to a point in world history or national history or anything else where evil stops existing and everybody acts in everybody's best interest. There's experiments, of course, that go on in our country that's quite unfortunate, defunding police and things like that. They find real fast that, that just by defunding police doesn't mean evil's going to stop and that it's not going to try and expand and reach its tentacles into every area of society. It actually speeds up because evil's always going to exist. And the other truth is simply this, that while evil exists and it seeks to expand, that truly good people can and often do sit idly by while it does. That has a sorry, sorry, and sad testimony throughout history. You can be one of the good guys and allow evil to have its way. It has happened, it probably is happening, and I'm sure it will happen in the future. Being a good guy and allow evil to have its way. And this is nowhere better seen, though, then on the night that Jesus is taken in the garden and led away to what amounts to be basically a kangaroo court to be convicted of false charges and murdered as a result. And that's what we're looking at here. Silence, right? If good people do nothing, what happens? I mean, if you consider yourself the good guy and you do nothing in the face of evil, what happens? That's what we're going to look at here this morning. But take a look at Matthew 21. We're going to, we're, we have to set something up very, very, very clearly. It's a key element of the whole idea within the message or, or the notion behind silence. And it's something that's somewhat, I suppose, um, overlooked at times. And that is this. Jesus' popularity, right? Jesus' popularity. In order for you to understand how silence contributed to Jesus winding up on a cross, you have to understand, first of all, how popular he was. Again, we're, we're reading mainly here from uh, the, uh, the Palm Sunday accounts, but nevertheless, it shows exactly how popular Christ was. Verse 8 says this, uh, And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way, and others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. Again, this is Palm Sunday. And in the multitudes, verse 9, that went before and that followed, they cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. You can't read that and not understand how popular Jesus was when he entered Jerusalem. It's always the Palm Sunday sort of conundrum. How popular can a person be one day and several days later they hang him on a cross? But nonetheless, no matter what the answer to that is, Jesus comes into Jerusalem, right? And they're throwing garments in front of him. They're laying palm leaves down. They're crying Hosanna, which is a messianic title. They're making it clear they consider this man their Messiah. And it says all the city was moved. And understand that at this time of the Passover, there were millions of people in Jerusalem and it says the multitude of them were running toward him throwing those leaves down throwing their, their, their jackets on the ground before him and just causing a tremendous uproar why? Jesus was popular I mean even the people who didn't know him it's an amazing thing that people knew who Jesus was considering the fact that he wasn't known by face to, to very many people we talked about this before last week but what happens is who is this? Who's causing this uproar? This is Jesus of Nazareth, a prophet, and they're crying Hosanna, which again, a messianic sort of thing. So I said last night, I remember if you were here last week, I said last week, and we ought to remember what we, what we talked about, namely that the rulers wanted to take Jesus by subtlety. 
Remember, that's why they needed a betrayer. They needed somebody who knew him by face and so forth, and they wanted to take him by subtlety, they said, for fear of the people. And this is evidence of this, right? This is evidence of it, that, that they see what they're seeing from their, their windows up above as they're seeing the people incredibly supportive of Jesus. And they know they just can't rush down there and grab him, right? Because the people will turn on them. You have to remember that. But you go on here, you go on in Matthew 21, and you find something else, a couple other things that sort of speak to, um, I don't know what I, I'm sorry, I needed to go back. A couple of other things that speak to it, that we talked about up there, chapter 21, look at verse 12. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold doves. And said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called the house of prayer, but you have made it a den of thieves. Jesus turning over the money changers' tables, right? You've seen pictures of it. You've seen artworks of it. You've imagined it in your heads. But you have to understand a couple of things about it, and that is that these guys were... You know, they were extorting money from people in order to line the pockets of the chief priests and the rulers, but they were hugely unpopular with the common person. You'd have, and uh, what would happen, I mean, if you're not aware of it, I don't know if I have time for this, but if you're not aware of it, people would bring their sacrifice to the temple of Passover, so everything from a dove to a lamb, and it would have to be inspected, right? And, and, or, or some people would just thought, well, I'll buy my sacrifice there, right? So they would come there, but you couldn't use... Uh, Roman money in the Jewish temple, and so you, it was basically an exchange rate. But you can only use the temple money when it comes to buying sacrifices. And the people who were setting the exchange rate in the temple were cheating people. It wasn't what it was supposed to be. And the excess went into the pockets of the chief priests and the scribes. So you can imagine, as a common person, you, you just hiked 100 miles to Jerusalem, and you want to make a sacrifice, and now they're cheating you, and there's nothing you can do until Jesus comes along, right? Jesus comes along, and this sort of strikes against the mealy mouth, sort of weak kneed Jesus that many people have in their mind. This is like a man's man Jesus. He goes over those tables, which are not small themselves, and he rolls them over and basically defies the people at the tables to do anything about it. And the people see it, and they're like rallying around him. Yeah! You can imagine, right? Yeah. yeah. Strike one for the common man kind of a thing. What does it do? It just makes Jesus even more popular among people. Millions of people who are there. Also, then he also says this. Another reason for his popularity, verse 14, and the blind and the lame came to him, <clears throat> and he healed them. I mean, turning over the tables of money is one thing, but healing people blind and lame. Not only is, does that, of course, engender affection from people because of Christ's compassion and his abilities, but it also says something else because healing the blind and the lame were considered messianic miracles. In other words, when the Jews saw that, they were taught in the Old Testament, you see people, he, you see someone healing the blind and healing the lame? That's your Messiah. And so they see this and they know this. And what does it do? It increases Jesus' popularity all the more. <clears throat> then take, take a look at the response here in verse 15. And when the chief priests and scribes saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and saying, Hosanna to the son of David, they were sore displeased. Right? They've... This is after Jesus raises Lazarus from the dead, and it was after <clears throat> Lazarus being raised from the dead that the chief priest decided Jesus had to die. But here it's getting even worse. They were even more enraged. They wanted him dead. They had already determined that he must die. But he was so popular. We can't just rush out and grab him. We can't just mistreat him. There's millions of people who will come after us. Again, so they send out the call for a betrayer. 
right? So <clears throat> we saw that, the, you know, you know, if you know the, the incident, we looked at it a little bit last week or last Sunday night, you know, they took Jesus under cover of darkness through the work of a betrayer. And it would seem that, that getting Jesus free from this arrest, so, so when it comes to this arrest, you see Jesus arrested in the garden, right? So let's just fast forward a little bit. Fast forward, you know how this goes. I won't have you turn there, we just don't have time. Jesus is arrested in the garden, right? And he's taken, he's taken to the high priest's house, right? You follow me? So this is all before that. So they come and get him in the garden. They take him to the high priest's house. So what do you do? I mean, if you're a disciple, right? If you're a disciple and you're in that garden with Jesus and you see him being led away, remember what Peter did? He grabs a sword, right? He whacks off an ear. I mean, that's righteous indignation, right? That's bravery. Because those are hardened soldiers that are standing there, and it would appear that Peter is ready to die with Christ. You're not going to overwhelm the guards. You're not going to storm the high priest's house, 12 of you. What would be the most, probably most effective thing of having Jesus released? It would seem, right? It would seem to me that getting Jesus free from this arrest would be to tell people. That's who they were afraid of. Right? That's who they were afraid of. They were afraid of the people. The people were very much, you know, in, in, infatuated with Jesus. They're very much embracing Jesus at this point. All the disciples had to do was seize on his popularity. Go tell all these people. Tell them they've taken Jesus. Tell them that they've arrested Christ, your Messiah. They've arrested your Hosanna. They've arrested the one that you have acknowledged to be the Savior. They've taken him. Let everyone know that he'd been apprehended by the rulers, and all you got to do is let the mob do the rest. Right? After all, he's still popular. If you go to the garden, right, it is, this is a couple of days before the garden or so. If you go to the garden, he hasn't lost any popularity. In fact, he retreats to the garden so often because he is so popular. He has to get away from the throngs of people. So he hasn't lost any of his popularity. Nothing happened overnight to make people turn on him. And all the disciples would have to do is round some of those people up and spread the word about how he was taken without cause and by deception. The crowd would just simply seemingly do the rest. But something else happens. Instead of disciples running around, knocking on doors and getting people up, or even in the next morning, right, telling people what happened, there's silence. There's silence. Those who could have worked to free Jesus from his death sentence fell quiet. So that's what we want to look at here first this morning, and maybe only this morning, the disciples' silence. Does it make sense what I've said so far? The idea of his popularity and all they have to do is get the mob whipped up and that would have set him free. All they have to do is say what happened. Describe how he was taken. Last week, again, we talked about betrayal, and although I, I didn't want to use the same word this week, it's still betrayal. If you had 12 very close friends, if you had 12 friends that were as close as family, and you were arrested wrongfully, if you were taken by someone, would you want them to go for help? Would you expect them to go for help? Would you, as one of those 12 people perhaps, one of those people who knew someone in your life that you were very close to, would you have gone for help? Would you have gone and called an attorney? Or would you have gone and called more friends? Or would you have called in a favor or two from somebody? It doesn't happen here. It happens that Jesus sold Jesus, Judas sold Jesus out to those who wanted him dead. The rest of the 11, when Jesus is arrested... They simply remain silent in Jesus' greatest hour of need. And again, there's three examples. We may only get through this one this morning, and it's one that's easy to pick on. He's been picked on for hundreds and thousands of years, but a big contributor to killing Jesus is the silence of Peter. And the first place, I, you know, take a look in, in Matthew 26, actually. Let's just turn a, a, a few pages over. Matthew 26 Look at verse 66. This is toward the end of the trial, right? Verse 66, what think ye? They answered, the authorities said, and said, he is guilty of death. Then, they, then did they spit in his face and buffeted him 
and others smote him with the palms of their hands. I mean, understand, these are the leaders of Israel. These are men of dignity and authority. They find him guilty and they spit on him and they punch him and they slap him with the palms of their hands and then mock him saying, prophesy unto us, thou Christ, who is he that smote thee? Men of dignity, men of honor and stature in Israel, reduced to playground bullying and mockery. Taylor 69, now Peter sat without in the palace and a damsel came unto him saying, thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. But he denied before them all saying, I know not what you sayest. Go ahead and, 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 and turn to John 18 because th this completes the thought of, of this idea of Peter and where he is. And we'll come back to this idea of what happened in, in Matthew 26. But in, in John 18, there's a passage here, a little section that helps us understand a little bit more about Peter. Because I think it, uh, yet you have to in some way give the man his due. Which, again, he often isn't. When Peter denies Jesus, where do you picture him? I'll bet most people picture him in the street. I bet most people, when he denies Jesus, at least, I know he does it more than once, and, and, but when you picture him primarily, what's the vision? Is it him at a 50-gallon barrel with fire coming out, warming him hands at the fire out of that? I mean, that's sort of what I picture, even though there are no 50-gallon drums in Jesus' day. But he's in the dirt street, in the dimly lit street, and so forth, and uh, to be sure, when he denied, of course, Jesus, you know this three times, but and in various places, but the first place is the most interesting. John chapter uh, 18, I think it is, that I had you turn to uh, wherever I am. Take a look uh, in verse, mm, let's see, 15. Well, verse 14. Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And this is where they are, Caiaphas, the high priest. Verse 15, and Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. But Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door and brought in Peter. Do you ever picture Peter inside the high priest's house when he denies Jesus? It's an interesting thing. Again, lots and lots can be said about Peter, and I'm not going to go over all of this. I'm actually wanting to give him a little bit of his due before I say something negative. I don't think we often identify, you know, with, we, we tend to think that Peter does something that is beyond any of us, and I don't know that that's actually true, and I think that it may be true that he would do more, he did more than most of us would do. What happens is we miss some obvious strengths here, and John 18 tells us that Peter was actually inside the high priest's palace. He may have only been in the outer courtyard, right? There's, there's, there's several elements to the high priest's palace, but he may have been inside just the inner courtyard, or he may have been in the next level in, but we're just really not told. And that disciple that's, that, that vouches for Peter must have been John, it would seem, John was known by the high priest family of some in some way, but, but what's interesting here when you look at it, it, it says, and this is something we have to understand as well, is that, um, let me see, where is it here? That Peter stood, the, verse 16, then went out that other disciple, assumedly this is John, because that's the way John always refers to himself, basically the third person. He, that other disciple, which was known unto the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. There's, there's a, a good case to be made that her that kept the door is a believer. Why else would she consent to it? You'll see here in a minute that, that there was a lot of believers in this whole affair. She may have actually been a believer in Jesus and consented to John for that reason, possibly. 
But here's the thing. When you read it, she lets Peter in, and it may have only been in the inner courtyard because of several reasons, but it may have been further. We just simply don't know. Right? <clears throat> but here's the question. Who here would have even gone that far? I mean, let's give the man his due. Who here would have gone as far as Peter? Who would have followed Jesus knowing exactly what was going to happen? And when you see him being taken inside the high priest's house, who would have had the guts to even go inside that door? Knowing what's going to happen. Peter does. Evidently, so does John. It's easy to think Peter was hanging out in the streets of Jerusalem, right? It's easy to think that. But in that courtyard, in that inner court of, of Caiaphas's house, Peter must have felt the crushing reality of what was happening. It's one thing to be out in the garden and, and, and do that act of bravery, but to go inside the lion's den and understand how puny and insignificant any effort you give would be is a whole different matter. And so it's easy to think that he was hanging out on the streets of Jerusalem and, and he overreacted to simply harmless questions. But here, the first question he was asked was in the high, courtyard of the high priest. I mean, he couldn't even get out. He's not outside. Right? That's, that's not what was going on. But in fact, the vehemence, uh, vehemence of his denials were evidently the result of where he was, not of sheer cowardice, at least the first one, you're in the middle of the people who are about to kill your savior, your leader, your, your teacher, your rabbi. In the lion's den, what do you say? So again, let's first give him his due, right? He's easy to pick on. Peter's easy to pick on. But that's one of the, one of the most time-consuming jobs the Lord will have when we're all in the presence of of Christ and Peter is reconciling all of the pastors who berated the poor man over these last several centuries, right? Got to get, make everybody get along, and Peter's got a long list of people I'm sure he's a little irritated with for having made him the punching bag for 2,000 years. So give him his due, that he's gone so far and gone to a place where not many would have. However, what you find, though, what it would seem is this. I don't even know where I am anymore. Yeah, I'm, not, I'm not there. I'm back here. Yeah, Peter was influenced by the crowd around him. Peter was, Peter was probably almost the, in this, in this, in this sort, of, sort of events, a prime example of people being motivated by the people around them. Seems strange to say, but when Peter was in the company of disciples, he was standing firm, ready to die for his Savior, right? Pulls that sword out, lops off someone's ear. Before that, he told Jesus that he was ready to die for him. And I believe, even though he, Jesus knew it was, it was inaccurate, I believe that in some level, Peter really believed that. And he was ready. I mean, you don't draw a sword on a bunch of Roman soldiers without being prepared to die. But notice that who he was with. He was with other disciples. He was with the 12. He was with Jesus. He's ready to go, right? But when he was finally in a place put up there, when he was finally in a place where people would gladly accommodate his willingness to die, he was a shrieking violet. I don't know him. With the disciples, let me cut off that ear in the, in the, in the courtyard of the high priest. I don't know him. What are you talking about? No, I wasn't me. What happens? Same thing that happens to people all over the place. In every church, in every year, in every decade and century and millennia since Jesus rose from the dead, the same thing happens, and that is this, that everyone is a fearless believer among believers. Aren't we? We're all fearless believers among believers. Let somebody come in here and start speaking ill of Jesus, and I bet you get every single one of you standing up and saying, how dare you, somewhat. But what about when you're in the lion's den? What about when you're at work, school, the store, among family? What about when you're the minority report? Let a few handfuls of goofs come in here and start making a ruckus that I bet we all are just gonna throw the Jesus at them in every way that we possibly can. 
But how about when we're not around 100 other believers? See, this is what happened with Peter, isn't it? I mean, he's with other believers, and my goodness, he's pulling out a sword, he's cutting off appendages, and he's telling Jesus he's ready to die for him in the high priest's house where everybody's against him. It's quite a different thing. It's another example here. First of all, let me just say this. It, I put it in my notes. It's another example of the wisdom of God in giving us each other. In giving us a church. Does that make sense? Because you step out the door, you're in the lion's den. Everybody needs to retreat among other believers. Right? Everybody needs to retreat to a place where they can share their burdens, where they can share their concerns, where they can rejoice together, sing together. Again, I've said this before, but how many of you get up in the morning, find a couple of people and go sing some songs? Right? Cheryl's up here says she's bouncing. I believe that. Believe what she says. She's bouncing. She's bouncing. She likes that singing part. It encourages people. It reminds us that we are not of this world. We need that. Right? You go out in the lion's den, right? We'll talk about that in a second. You go out there. You go in the courtyard of the high priest of the world and secularism's house. You need to come back and you say, man, that song helped me. Man, that, that, that preaching helped me. Amen? Right? Man, that teaching helped me. Man, that fellowship helped me. Man, that prayer helped me. That's the wisdom of God giving us a church. Everyone, again, has to be in the lion's den from time to time, but even the strongest and most determined among us will wilt if we don't have the encouragement and fellowship of fellow believers of each other. That's why we're here. One thing to note at this point, and I'm not gonna get to my second point. One thing to note at this point about the 12 disciples. The silence, right, the silence. Here's a collective testimony of what happened up to Jesus being taken to the high priest's palace. Of course, Judas betrayed Jesus, 30 pieces of silver. You have here and you have, of course, in Peter's other places, and when I say silence, of course, it's not that Peter said nothing, it's that he said nothing positive. He never said nothing in advocacy for Jesus. He never went and told anyone else. He never got the crowd, but he, he actually denied Christ. The next time you'll see Peter is after the resurrection. Now, oh, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, well, yeah, after the resurrection. The 10 others, there are 10 other disciples. They completely disappear, largely. I mean, from the time that they take Jesus to the time he's on the cross, you don't hear a thing. Not by name anyway. I'm not saying they weren't there, but it's a measure of how far into the shadows, you know, they, they kind of got small. They didn't want anybody to really know. Why weren't they in the streets screaming? Why weren't they going door to door to people they knew would help? They scatter, right? They scatter. How many of you read about the great feats of Thaddeus? How many of you can name the 12 disciples? Bartholomew, Thaddeus, right? Those are two of my, my the names I can't forget because they're so unusual to me. You know what? You never hear from them again. Uh, not that they weren't there, mind you. It's just an interesting little anecdote that their silence that, that began when the, when the soldiers came to get Jesus seems to go on into the Bible. They were there, and they were doing things. Don't get me wrong. I'm just saying that you don't see their names anymore. In Jesus' hour of need, what you find is that not one of his disciples calls for help. Not one rounds up the people. Not one of them are crying in the streets. None do anything whatsoever to affect the release of Jesus. None. Again, the crushing, I, I, I can't imagine how crushing this was for Jesus to know that the people he was closest to, and again, you can, I know that it was prophesied, and I know that Jesus is fully God, but you cannot deny Jesus his humanity. To know that these who he's closest to and he's lived with and laughed with and did miracles in front of and provided for, to know that they just, pfft, gone. I 
What Peter did was undeniably brave. Nevertheless, it was not very prudent, and it led to the most famous denial in history. Similarly, you have here, I put here again, that's the one I have here is this. Because of his massive popularity, right? That's what I got here, yeah. Massive popularity, killing Jesus depended on the disciples being silent when the plot was most vulnerable. You, you never see the leaders talk about this, right? You never see the leaders mention this. But if they were afraid of the people, if they didn't go and get Jesus openly and in the street because they were afraid of the people, right? Somehow, either they knew or had their fingers crossed that when they finally did arrest him, those guys would shut up. Those guys would be quiet. Those guys wouldn't have the nerve. Those guys wouldn't have the guts. Those guys wouldn't have the wherewithal, the spine, whatever you want to call it. They somehow, it depended on their being silent. I put it here in my notes. Similarly, we've been we've been talking about some stuff in Sunday school class and other things, and, and of course on Wednesday night I'm reading about stuff, and here's here's part of the thing. Because of Jesus' unpopularity today, in the disciples' time it was because of his popularity that the silence was required, but because of Jesus' unpopularity, our neighbors and our nation's misconception, ambivalence, and hatred for Jesus was created and is sustained by silent disciples today. By disciples who are not only silent in terms of witness, in terms of identification, but who are silent because they don't know what to say. Because they're so unfamiliar with their own faith, they're afraid that anyone makes an accusation because they don't want to look dumb. They don't want to look silly. They don't want to look stupid. So they just sort of wilt back. It's very strange. The, 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 the thing with Peter was, and the thing that we'll see tonight with influential disciples and so forth, is, is that they're quiet because, and, and it's just bizarre because they could have done something to help. They could have actually done something effective by telling people, and they don't seize on it. We're different. Because he's so unpopular, we don't want to identify with him. Because he's, I mean, isn't he? Is Jesus not unpopular today? Turn around, and every place you turn, I mean, it's like a carnival of freaks, and and the punchline of every joke, right? And the 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 the, the source of all the blame. You can make fun and belittle Jesus and his people. you can't even speak anymore. That's our society. How does it happen? We say, well, society. Well, what about us? What have we done? What have we said? And I don't mean in a mean fashion. I don't mean standing up and being jerks. I mean being disciples. You say, well, you obviously don't understand Jesus. You obviously have never been told what the gospel is really all about. And you know what happens to you? And I, I, uh, I got to be careful. I, I got to stop because I'm in this with you guys. It's just so tough sometimes. We keep supporting the garbage, don't we? We're selling Jesus out for 17 bucks a month to Netflix. That's tough, and that's, that's holding the mirror up to me. But when do we get tired enough to say slash do something? The silence of the disciples helped the bad people put the good person on a cross. Silence of today's disciples keep Jesus obscure and they keep him in the place of derision in our nation. We're not going to change our nation. I, I, I don't think. I'm, I'm a pessimist on these matters. But this season, as we lead up to Jesus dying and rising again, how silent have we become? That's the question. And for what reason? I can look at Peter. Here's the thing, again, again, and I'm done with this, I promise, I'm done. Here's the thing. With Peter, 
a lot of people have said, ah, what a doofus, right? What a, how could he deny Jesus? Ah, he's just out there in the street with this gal and he's just so scared. We don't even realize he was inside the high priest's house. And he had the guts to go that far. We deny him for so much less. Don't we? I mean, isn't it possible? Don't you see it around us? Jesus? Who's Jesus? Jesus? What are you talking about? As everybody else is talking about stuff. Again, if you don't feel comfortable talking to people about Christ, you can. You can know your Bible better. You can, right? If you don't feel comfortable talking to people about, about the dangers, right, of invoking the wrath of God by what they're doing or how they're behaving, you can. You can be a force for change. You can be a force for good. I'm not talking about changing the entire nation. I'm talking about changing the people in your sphere of influence. You can. But not if we're quiet. Tired of being quiet. Father, this morning, grateful for the opportunity to open your word with these people. Father, I'm grateful for the chance to consider where we are in the whole scheme of this seemingly constant deterioration of the testimony of your son among the people we know. Father, again, silence is what enabled your son to go to a cross or people to put him on a cross. Silence of disciples not unlike us. Father, help us to take our eyes off the things of this world, of people's esteem and opinion of Jesus, and just be your disciples. Help us, Father, not to continually reenact the silence of the disciples in your son's day, but to be counted and be heard in everything we do. As these things in Christ's name, amen.